Welcome to the Scoop Road Order Sunday night. It is the best absolute 45 minutes of our day. We are going to review Michigan State film. We're going to talk about Michigan's gambling uh, issues that are uh, coming up in Matt Weiss's computer. A lot of that is going to be, I think the big smoky gun at Nevada Luck pointed that out. Uh, there's an agency that's investigating that. That could get real nasty. So we're going to get into all of that. Uh, break down our uh, players of the game. Uh, just the thoughts going forward. Obviously, Minnesota, another layup. And then we got the big dogs. We have the big blue bellies up in Ann Arbor. We're going to get into all that. Appreciate you guys always kicking it with us. It is Sunday night. Uh, we always go right between the uh, night game or the afternoon games and the night game. Uh, so we get this little 45 minute order to talk some football with you guys. Get those super chats fired up. If you guys have a question you're dying to know, uh, Super Chats are answered immediately. They stop our show and we answer the question for you. So we appreciate those. As always, uh, shout out where you guys are watching from. If you enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. Going to get right into it. Uh, Nevada, we're going to get into uh, the Michigan stuff um, in a second. But just your initial thoughts post-game. Uh, Michigan State, again, they're, they're flaccid, terrible uh, trash program like they've been uh, really since, you know, that year they beat us, um, which was the worst loss in Ohio State history, the 2015 team that was maybe the best team in Ohio State history lost. Um, but your thoughts after the dominating win, uh, again, I will say this again, Cade Stover is the toughest player in Ohio State history. He is an absolute animal because I know what he had done. I'm not going to talk about it, but I mean, I didn't think we'd see him till Michigan and he's out there against a kind of a worthless opponent. But I also think you know, you're a senior. He only has one more game left in the horseshoe folks, and then he's done. So he strapped it up and went. So uh, big props to him, but your thoughts, Nevada. Well, I, I thought it was a couple things. One, you know, and I, I put this in, in my uncomfortable truths column, but I, 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 I'm really struck by how the 2023 defense has really kind of redefined for me what, great defense is about or what great defense is in, in, in this year, because I've normally, you know, obviously we associate it with points and with yards and, you know, those are kind of you know primary metrics. But when you look at the secondary metrics, you're generally looking at things like turnovers and tackles for losses and sacks and things like that. And if you look at all those categories, Ohio state is near the bottom, not only the big 10 in the country in a lot of those statistics. And it's, it's just, it's a fundamentally different type of defense that Knowles is playing right now, and it's just it's magnificent to watch. And I'm not sure people really realize how different this is, how much of a change this is, how masterful of a job that he's doing right now, because they are limiting big plays, they are winning third down, they are winning in the red zone, and as a result, you know they're not going for as many you know high risk or you know, plays that would have naturally resulted in things like turnovers and sacks and tackles for losses. And they're just stifling other teams. And um, I, I mean, it, it's as different as when people are watching the silver bullets and they we were in that blitz you know, heavy package and people were like, wow, look how different this is. That's how different this defense is. It's unlike anything that we've ever seen at Ohio state. And frankly, I'm, I'm trying to think about where else I've seen it. I mean, they're just super responsible, you know, and just, I mean, it's just, you're watching a maestro playing out there and these guys really are together. They really know what they're doing. Um, but you've got to adjust your expectations about what you're looking for, for defensive football, because you're not seeing the big splash plays and you're not seeing, you know, the big negative plays, which normally we associate with it. And uh, that's, that's fun. That that's, that's point one. Point two is, you know, people are waiting on Kyle McCord to be great or, or be CJ Stroud or be Justin Fields or be whatever. Dude, I, I think he's arrived. I think, he, I think he's there. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, you know, yeah. he's not CJ Stroud and he's not Justin Fields, but he's a really good college quarterback. And, yeah. you know, we, we got to see that yesterday. I don't care who you're playing against. You put up numbers like that against error, against your kids. Those are great numbers. And he's, he's getting better. You know, we, we, you know, he's been really, really good the second half of games. And people are like, well, let's see him do it in the first half of games. Well, he was really, really good in the first half of the game. And if he plays anywhere like that down the stretch, we are going to be incredibly difficult to beat. So I am extremely bullish on Kyle McCord. And in the rewatching, it was it was even better. And and let me tell you, I thought the first half of the, of the game, I thought that was Ryan Day's best offensive play calling of the season. I, th I thought it was that good. Yep. I thought he he was dialed in. He knew what he wanted to do. They were doing it. And I think they had like, I counted like one loser play in the entire first half. 
That's yeah. how good Ryan Day was. So uh, oh. no, it was a it was a, a real fun rewatch. Well, and like that's the fun thing about seeing Kyle McCord's progression is because for those of you that don't know, I know that like Ryan Day is Mister Rosy Cheeks and mental health guy and all that stuff. He coaches the crap out of the quarterbacks, and I mean he is like the exorcist. So if you're not playing good, it is steaming hot in that room. So when you have a couple stinker games. You know, he is not uh, scared to uh, to tell you about it. I mean, he is, he's a guy. And again, that's what good coaches do. They, they don't mince words. They're not there to be your homie. They're not your buddy. They're there to develop you. It's a lot like Urban Meyer. Like Urban Meyer, like, you know, if people saw what we did to get kids to develop, I mean, they'd probably throw us in jail. But we make kids amazing. We make kids really good. And again, it's just like the military. You know, it's like, you, know, you watch, everybody wants to be saved by the Navy SEALs, but they don't want to see what the Navy SEALs have to do to become Navy SEALs. So, I mean, Kyle McCord's development is not some cosmic accident that all of a sudden he's getting really, really good. Uh, obviously, he's more comfortable. Again, as you progress through your career, um, I think he was blessed. Honestly, he didn't have to play until he was a third year sophomore. So he wasn't a true freshman or, you know, even CJ had to play as a redshirt freshman because we didn't really have anybody. Uh, and that's hard. That's really hard. Um, and CJ obviously is, Probably, I mean, he could be in the conversation as, as one of the greatest players in Ohio State history. Uh, especially if he wins, if he wins the NFL MVP as a rookie, he's going to be right in that top ten-ish, five-ish, you know, the very, very best. Uh, and it's almost crazy that we never won anything with this kid, given how good he's proven to be uh, with a with a notoriously bad franchise in the Houston Texans. But Kyle, again, if you're a quarterback, again, like Drew Aller, who I think is impossibly stupid. By not going, I mean, Ryan Day went after him hard. You know, when Quinn Ewers reclassified, they wanted Drew Aller very badly. And Drew Aller said, nope, I'm going to go to Mike Yersich and James Franklin. And again, you know, when you're one of these quarterbacks and, you're, and you have Ryan Day calling you and offering you a scholarship, to turn that down is like, you know what? I hate money. I don't want to make any money. I, I just, I, I don't want to do it. I want to go to Penn State. and Maybe I could be Trace McSorley and be a seventh round pick and play in the XF, USFL or whatever, but I don't want to go work with Ryan Day, who everything he touches in the quarterback room turns into, oh, I don't know, $30 million a year extension on at the floor. That's like Justin Fields. CJ Stroud's extension in five years is going to be like $80 million a year. So, you know, I don't know why you turn that down unless you're just really stupid. Um, and by the way, uh, I talked to a uh, big time guy at Ohio State. He called me today to say how funny it was that I was going in on James Franklin and Mike Yersuch and saying how stupid they were and how bad their play calling was and how it was an embarrassment. And if I was one of those kids on that team, I'd say, you guys, you're not giving us a chance to win. And guess what? He, I, James Franklin must be on Buckeye Scoop because he fired Mike Yersuch today. I was like, that was like the most embarrassing. I mean, those, those guys actually get paid money to call that game. And I was like, you didn't even give the kids a chance against Michigan. And that's why... You know, like I, everyone's scared of the big bad wolf, Michigan. And I'm like, again, maybe I'm crazy, but I do have eyeballs and I watch every one of their games. I watch their coaches film. I think they're good. They're not like they're not like 2021 Georgia or 2019 LSU good. I mean, they're they're good. And to win in Ann Arbor is the hardest thing you can do as an Ohio State football player or coach. That is that is exceptionally hard to do. Like our maybe the best team in Ohio State history is the 1969 team. They went up there and you know, spit the bit and lost to a team, you know, Bo's first year. So again, if you're a student of history, you know how hard it is to win in Ann Arbor. Nevada, how are you feeling at this point about the game? Because I feel better every week. I think that this team is chomping at the bit. Again, I think, you know, having two turds in a row, Michigan State and Minnesota, you can sit guys, rest guys, uh, get guys right for, for the game. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, look, I mean, we, we, do a column every week where we put down our kind of our game predictions and our thoughts and our processes and, and kind of how we see the game is going. And I can generally tell when I'm kind of going through it, whether or not I've got a finger on the pulse of the Ohio State team. And there've been some years when I've just been off. There's been some years mm -hmm. where it's like, I thought they'd be good and they were bad. I thought they'd be bad and they were good. And, and you're just kind of getting whipsawed left and right. And this year I have been dialed in. Um, uh, the I, I feel like I've, I've got a uh, really good handle. Um, the team, you know, the, not not that it was particularly challenging, but like I think this week my score prediction was thirty-five to three, and it turned out to be thirty. I mean, I mean, I've been like almost spot on every single week. I'm telling you, we're going to win in Ann Arbor. We're, yes. we're better than that. Oh the, yeah. The, oh yeah. The, they do not have a Trey Henderson. They do not have yeah. a Marvin Harrison Jr. And they're they're just not as good as they were in the past year. They they were decent teams in the, in the, the past years that were cheating, that knew yeah. what was coming. That's how they held C.J. Stroud last year. C.J. freaking Stroud and Paris Johnson <laughs> and Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka. And 
they held that team to three points in the second half because they knew what was coming. And, you know, I, I had a guy make a really good point to me, somebody who's kind of in the know on the whole thing about Michigan. And he's like, you know, one of the things that's in the manifesto is talking about, because part of the, the manifesto was kind of a audition thing. It was kind of like his, his, his thoughts, oh. his, his ruminations, his dream. But it was oh. kind of part of, part of it was his audition thing to Harbaugh in terms of what he could do. And in there, he he says, he talks about the second half advantage that they would enjoy in these games because teams would be forced to change their signs and he would have a complete library and he would know in the second half exactly when they went to their signs because they couldn't come up with an entirely new sign system. But he would know exactly when they went in the second second half what their signs were from from watching previous games and it would create this huge advantage for Michigan in the second half of games. And I was like, man, that's really smart. And that, that really kind of explains the Michigan second half dominance, which kind of leads into the whole Michigan gambling thing. Because I want to talk a little bit about that. We've talked a little about this, but yep. I want to get this. I, we, U.S. Integrity. As Google the firm. Check the firm out. It was mentioned in the Big Ten letter. We've talked a little bit about this. But they are the firm that looks for gambling line inconsistencies, inefficiencies in the market, uh, things that just aren't right when it comes to sports gambling, and they are the firm that does all these things. Now, when you tie this together with Weiss's computer, Weiss's computer had gambling cookies on it, which means that he was connecting to gambling sites, Daily Fantasy, Sportsbook, so he was gambling. Now, we all know how bad that is, but you, you can't do that. Well, apparently, it goes beyond that, and it goes to other people in Shenbeck, they're all other interns, other staff members, other people were gambling on the game. Now, weren't, I can't say with certainty that they were gambling on Michigan games, whatever, but they were gambling. They were connecting <laughs> to the sites. They were playing the Daily Fantasy. They were yeah. doing the things. And you've got U.S. Integrity that's now not only um, under uh, the uh, an agreement and doing work for the NCAA, they're also doing work for the Big Ten Conference. Yeah. Looking at this looking at the issue, looking at for, you know, game to game variability on these lines and seeing how deep this thing gets. And um, I think it's, I think that's the thing that's going to blow this thing wide open is when the gambling angle comes on this, because, you know, it, you want to talk about lack of institutional control. They've already got all the, all the elements of lack of institutional control. You've got repeat offender, you've got line to the NCAA, You've got massive, viol- you know, just rampant violations that go up and down the organization, and now you've got you throw gambling into the mix on top of on top of this. I, oh, yeah. I think this thing's gonna, gonna gonna blow wide open, and I think it's gonna. I, I I think the NCAA wants to do it on an expedited basis because they know how big this is, and um, I think that, that that's definitely coming. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's every league in the world employs these guys. So these guys make a ton of money, and these guys also are ex- they're excellent at what they do. They have the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, you, you know, big. T- I mean, you see every you know, uh, MGM Grand, Caesars Palace. I mean, basically every single entity that touches gambling employs these guys to monitor fraud. So when these guys come sniffing around, this is not good for for the old uh, the old uh, maize and blue. Because I'm telling you, these guys. These guys do not play. They're ultra sophisticated. Nevada, is that something that you feel like has been kind of an underserved narrative? Because you don't hear about this much. The fact that these guys are getting investigated by these guys. I mean, that's like, you know, it's like the feds showed up to your office and taking all the the laptops or something. And you're like, oh, well, you know, he also, uh, you know, took someone's uh, bottle of water out of the fridge, too. It's like nobody. That's all they report on. Oh, they just took all the servers and all the hard drives and. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, this seems to be the story to me because, I mean, these guys are employed by every major sporting entity and every major gambling entity that there is. I mean, MGM, like all the big dogs are right at the top of the page. You know, they, they didn't do that by an accident. You know, they put all you know, the NFL, Bet MGM, Caesars, uh, basically all of Las Vegas uh, is monitored by because Is that an underserved narrative? Well, I mean, you look, they, I mean, the, the Big Ten talks about it in the letter. Well, they don't talk specifically about it, but they talk around, they talk about other things that have to remain confidential. That all goes back to Weiss's computer. I mean, just think back for you guys, just, you know, we're not asking to believe in crazy conspiracy theories or 10 foot aliens or, you know, Bigfoot yeah. or whatever, without yeah. with all due respect to Bigfoot Buckeye. 
Um, we're talking about <laughs> like when Weiss got fired, just ask yourself as a fan, if you were following that, did, didn't you think that was weird? Didn't you think it was weird how they came down and he got fired for a computer oh, the, access? Crime? I mean, it was yeah. weird. The, the one thing I'll say is it was, here's what's weird. Not only did he get fired like in the dark of the night, he didn't go anywhere. Like this is the offensive coordinator for Michigan who won the big 10 two years in a row, dominant program, offensive coordinator gets whacked and he didn't land as like an analyst for the Chicago bears or a quality control coach at with Alabama, or he didn't go anywhere. So that was what was weird to me because, you know, anybody, I mean, you know, if Charles Manson ran a really good offense and he got fired, like Nick Saban would hire him as an analyst, you know, for the season. Cause those guys, you know, if they get fired, you know, for one, they're getting paid for the year, as long as they're not fired for cause for two, they like to go and just learn. Uh, they like to just go and learn the, uh, learn kind of, you know, football. So they'll go, they'll go to a program. Like that's why, you know, Nick Saban's the goat. Cause he's got a bullpen of guys that are out of work. That'll work there for, you know, a hundred grand or whatever, 150 grand. And, you know, they'll, they'll just learn football. And then, you know, if one of his coordinators or a couple coordinators go or his position coaches go on to be coordinators, then he has a bullpen of guys that already know the players, they already know the system, and he could just plug the, like Blaine Kiffin was an analyst when, when he got fired on the tarmac at USC, they literally just, he went to Bama, worked there for a year, Steve Sarkeesian left, went to the Atlanta Falcons, and they just promoted Lane Kiffin, who, who already knew the offense and already knew the players, and that's like a seamless way to transition because like Nick Saban's had more staff turnover than any coach in the history of mankind. And he still keeps that thing like rocking. Um, we got a bunch of super chats piling up, so we got to get to these Nevada. I apologize. Uh, but no, I think that was, it was the weirdest thing ever. The fact that he literally got fired and he didn't land anywhere. And then he just went dark. You know, so well, he's, he radio, something... he, he, he's radioactive. I mean, he's radioactive yeah, right exactly. now. And no, exactly. Yeah. He, he's radioactive in a profession where, Nothing can make you radioactive. Like like Steve Sarkeesian got drunk at the USC pep rally and he was working for Nick Saban as the OC like a year later. You know, and then he, now he's the head coach in Texas. It's like, you know, it's short of like shooting up an orphanage. Like you can basically always coach if you're good at it. Um, uh, Bobby Petrino actually just got fired at, at AM too. So there he goes. Another great one. Uh, Casey, appreciate you, brother. Thank you for the 10. Great show. Better coach Trussell or Meyer. That's a, that is what it, probably the, the question I get af, asked the absolute most because I know them both. They're uh, f- just fantastic people, fantastic coaches. Um, then additionally, you said Penn State should have won. Michigan couldn't protect Bradley. I agree. Uh, we match up well with uh, that team at North. I also agree. Our defense this year versus Michigan is the difference. I, I think this is one of the best super chats we've ever gotten because I mean the, the question is fantastic, and then you know I I, I think we match up fantastic well. But Nevada, I'll let you go first. Trussell or Meyer. Who you, Meyer. Who you, if you're get okay, there, you go. Meyer. Yeah, I, easy. Yeah, I, easy. See, you, you put you put a gun to my head, man. It's, it's got to be Meyer. And I love, 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 love Jim Trussell. I love. He's like my father. He called me on my birthday last week. Left me a great voicemail. Called him right back. I love Jim Trussell. But like, I've also been on the other side of the field when Urban Meyer like whooped us, you know, beat us like a new guy in prison out in Glendale. So, and then I was lucky enough to actually work for Urban Meyer. So working for Urban Meyer was easily the hardest year of my life. And it wasn't because it was bad. It was just because we worked. I'm talking about you put your seatbelt on at 6 a.m. and you don't take it off till 6 p.m. And then I'd go to night school and get my MBA done from 6 to 10. So I was working from 6 to 10 every day, like literally five days a week. And then, you know, in season, you're, you're the weekends, you work all weekend. Like you work till you hit that bye week, man, you're working like 100 straight days. So it's, it is absolutely brutal. But I never had a bet. It was the best year of my life. I got my MBA done. Uh, I learned more football than I could ever dream I could learn. Again, that's part of the reason why I love doing this show is because I worked for him and I learned so much football, so much about how to run an organization, uh, you know, alignment. You know, I mean, he just, he's literally like he's Steve Jobs just in, you know, football, you know, football gear, well, football white long t shirts that he likes to wear. So um, I, I love Coach Meyer. And also, he was the first guy to offer me a scholarship. So, you know, you never forget like the guy that gives you is the first guy to take a chance on you when you're a you know 16 year old kid. But when he's at Bowling Green, he's the first guy for me. So I'd go Urban. Um, yeah, I I think we match up great. I think the defense is the difference. I think Jim Knowles. Again, people you know they, they get all obsessed with all these stupid stats and analytics. And again, Bill Belichick, who's probably the greatest coach who's ever lived, his 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 best quote is that stats are for losers, and they are. They're absolutely for losers. The only stat I care about with defense is points allowed. That's it. I don't, we gave up 800 million yards, but if we give up 17 points a game, we're going to win every game. 14 points a game, 10 points a game, we're going to win every game. So, 
you know, I don't care if we have one sack, 800 sacks. I mean, Jim Knowles led the nation in sacks, like 56 sacks or 57 sacks last year at uh, Oklahoma State. What'd they win? Go look at their trophy hall. Go, you know, they had all them sacks. Like, did they win anything? No. So, you know, again, I just want to play good, sophisticated defense, nice and tight. He's, and again, with Jim Knowles and, and these, this defensive staff, they know if you want to freelance and you want to play around, you ain't, you ain't going to be seeing the field. There's some young guys, some young guys are finding that out right now. There's some young guys that, you know, everyone's, you know, been dying to see five star kids that are you know, sophomores now. They're not playing at all because they like the freelancers. You want to freelance with Jim Knowles, man. You're going to be standing next to, you're going to be standing next to uh, uh, Ryan Day on the sideline eating popcorn. Um, Nevada, do you believe the defense is the difference this year? Yeah, I mean it's it's I mean it it's it's pretty readily apparent that that's the biggest difference between last year's team and this year's team is you've got I mean you got dudes I mean you got dudes you know, we've talked about it ad nauseum but he had five starters last year that didn't even sniff the NFL draft and this year you're you're probably entire entire too deep will be NFL draft choices so he's got guys he's got experience he's a smart dude. He learned what he needed to learn, uh, but we're seeing a master class right now on defense. I mean, it's uh, it's it's fun it's fun to watch because this is a this is a cohesive group. Not saying that they're gonna not ever give up, you know, some drives or some points or whatever it is, but uh, he he seems to choke teams out pretty good, and that's why I think you know as much as I've been concerned about us against the power run. You know that that can be stopped. You can stop it when they line up seven guys. I mean, you know. That that's stoppable. What's to me the stuff that's much more difficult to stop is a true multiple offense, and, and Michigan does not present that kind of a challenge. They they've got a, a capable running quarterback who's a decent thrower, but I mean he threw for seventy yards against Penn State. I mean he's yeah you know, they don't have any dynamic playmakers on the outside. They don't have a great tight end. Um, their running backs are fine. So no, but the the, I, I, the defense has been a. Not, not a surprise because we said it was going to happen and it happened. I uh, I totally agree. I <laughs> I don't know what to make of this one. Thank you for the five. Bane, job poker. It's great. It's great to be a Michigan Wolverine. And then there's like little clown stuff and go bucks. I mean, they are rallying around this guy now, man. I mean, the president's like tweeting out bet and all this craziness. I mean, so either they're going to look really right, which I, I don't, I think they're just, they're, they're the people that say the Titanic can't be sunk. You know, oh, it's an unsinkable ship. And then all of a sudden it hits that iceberg, man. It gets real cold. That water was real cold for those guys that thought that. Uh, but I appreciate the five, my man. Uh, D Sunny, my dude, is always on here. I appreciate you as always. You're one of the super regulars. Uh, appreciate all your regulars. You guys are the absolute best. Uh, you guys that tune in every night. We always enjoy kicking it with you. But D Sunny, everyone needs to listen to the 11 minute mark of yesterday's show when Nevada told Michigan to enjoy the current moment. And then for two minutes, explain why and how the end is coming. Great show. Uh, again, like, you know, it's not an accident that we're the number one rated Ohio State podcast now. And it's because we put a lot of work into this and we have fantastic information and fantastic sources. So, you know, a lot of the stuff we can't go on because it's just, you know, it's un, it's not kosher to go on uh, some of the injury stuff, some of the inside stuff, you know, because we're going to protect the team. Because, again, we want these guys to win every game. That's great for us. And I know it's great for all you guys, too, because you guys love it. Uh, Nevada, um, again, you've you've been locked down on the projections and the picks this year on BuckeyeScoop.com, just how you see the games going. Um, anything to sway you uh, this week? Obviously, this will be another layup against Minnesota, um, but you're feeling good about the Michigan game? I mean, I've watched that Penn State-Michigan game twice now, and it's, I just I can't see it, and I, and I could be dead wrong, but I don't see it. Yeah, I I, I think it's it would take some really weird stuff to happen to, to you know keep us from winning that game. And, that, you know, we've all seen games where that can happen, so you, you, you never say never, but we're better than they are, and we're, yeah. we're a better team. We're better, we're better offensively. We're better defensively. We're not better on special teams because everybody's better than we are on special teams. But, you know, oh um, we, we've got we, – we've We got, had to waste another time out yesterday. I'm like, it's almost like a Saturday Night Live. It's, it's like it's punked. I keep waiting for MTV to show up with the old show, punked. But go ahead, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, and and look, I mean, it's it, it, it's funny, you know, Michigan and the TRO. Michigan, when, when they went for the TRO, remember the whole thing? Oh, we're gonna go for the TRO. We're gonna get it. He'll be on the field, you know. And and he wasn't. And no. the, you know, the, the the court didn't even agree to see you know hear the hear. So you're going for this argument of irreparable harm, which is really at the essence of a, a temporary restraining order. When this guy, this coach, has been suspended now for four games this year and you've won every one of the games so it's like mm -hmm. if, if any if anything michigan should not want him to be on the sideline 
so they can continue their winning ways. But um, it doesn't seem like the court is particularly moved by their argument about irreparable harm, and and certainly they can't they can't believe that they're going to ultimately prevail on the thoughts because the the Big Ten bylaws are really specific. When you're, yeah. a penalty is administered from the joint committee, it's not appealable. Yeah. It's just what it is. It's to be promptly executed, and it's not appealable. So if you don't like that, now, please, now this is the other thing. This is, you know, for all you guys out there, Nevada Buck just had a birthday, and we've got Christmas right around the, the corner. Yeah, yeah, we do. Christmas is coming. My, my, mine was on November 4th. Scorpio's and, in the and house. Kirk, Kirk, Kirk <laughs> November 4th. All Nevada Buck wants for Christmas is Michigan to leave the Big Ten. So this, there's all this talk about Michigan. About Michigan. Oh, we're going to leave. We'll oh, my God. Leave. Where, where are you going to go? Like, You're going to go to the please, SEC? Oh, please, please go down there. Please leave. Oh, God, yeah. Please leave. Okay, oh. guys? We don't care. Nobody cares about your stupid little program. We just added USC, UCLA, Oregon, yeah. Washington. We don't give a whatever about you. So please uh, leave. Okay. Go, go uh, to the ACC and go to the, uh, the SEC, go where, go independent, go wherever you want to go, but we don't care. No one cares. So that's what Nevada <laughs> buck wants. So if you guys want to, you know what Nevada buck wants, you guys could just think, just be like, always think at night, just be like, Hey kids, let's say a prayer for the, uh, the people in Israel. And let's say a prayer for the Ukrainians. And let's say a prayer for the Michigan to leave the big 10. And if we get those three things, then then I'm going to be happy. Yeah, I mean, them leaving like when you had USC and Oregon and Washington, it's like it's like when you get that group of like fat like five fat chick or five hot chicks and the one fat chicks at the end, and she's like, "This isn't fine. I'm going to leave." But the five hot chicks are going to say, "I'd be like, see ya. It's more food for us, more booze for us." I love that. Um, this is uh, this is another one. I appreciate you, Matt Peck, again, my dude. Uh, thank you for the ten. Just want to say you guys are the best pods out there. Appreciate that, my man. Zach does a great job too. Do you guys think Lathan will be back from Michigan? I, I don't think there's any chance. I think he's he's uh, gonna be done for long term, was the term I was told. Uh and also Tommy's injury. Any idea? I think he's back from Tommy's back from Michigan. They'll hold him this week, though. Uh your thoughts on that, Nevada? Yeah, initially the thought on Lathan was that he'd be back by Michigan, and that does definitely does not look that way. We've got a report that did not sound uh promise in that regard and that's that's a shame but hey you know I, i've said this all year long i don't sweat stuff like that man it's next man up no. and no. It, as bad as that is for lathan there is another nfl quality guy right behind no. him who's ready to step up and, and have his moment and it, you know if, if if for some reason something bad happens and we lose it it's not because we didn't have lathan ransom i can guarantee you that yeah exactly we're i mean i mean our our depth on you know in the back four has been unbelievable i mean we got jermaine matthews and we got guys that are just cooking right now so it's it's fun well we got to dive into the film room i know you guys have been dying for this i know i get a lot of comments on this your boy ryan was on he was he i mean he was you know lighting a cigar during this one man because he was he was lit i mean this is this is a beautiful design this counter action so you got you know, a lot you got a lot of eye candy here you got the pull guard you got the fake pull where you know, G Scott, he pulls the e-brake. That's the brake that's in the middle of your car, and he swings back around here, uh, all to get uh, the Heisman man another touch in a creative way. But I mean, this is just butt naked all the way to the end zone. I mean, isn't? I mean, and Josh Hart doesn't even block anybody. I mean, he doesn't have to. He's, he's kind of sizing them up. But you know, I mean, this is just gorgeous. I mean, again, and, and this is good. You know, the guy. It's funny. The guy's got the tough block here. Is Carson? He's got to come and make sure that this guy does not get upfield, and that that can be tough. And you got to snap, and you got to hook. And you know the good thing is that is that Marvin is super deep on this, but I love the action, you know, the handoff because this is all off stuff that we already do. We've been running, we ran the tight end counter last week, and I was laughing because I was like, God, I mean, gee, he's not very good at that because it's like it's a it's a tough block. I mean, dude, like he's a tight end. I mean, how many times do you see tight ends pull in the history of football? Not very often, but here he's fantastic. He stops on a dime, swings out here, uh, locks down the corner. You know, again, this is a. Uh, this is just, it's just all good. You know, and then Josh does a great job of leaking out here. You know, Josh has to like, he has to clear this guy. He has to clear, get flat. Uh, this was one of my favorite plays because we used to run reverses and this is how you do it. Uh, then he has to climb to whatever he can find. So, you know, you, you the, the force guy is for G and he does fantastic. You know, he, he gets on him, but I mean, this is just fantastic design. Um, 
And again, I think it's it's great to get Marvin a creative touch just because, you know, like, I mean, those are those are the kind of plays that they'll show at, at the Heisman ceremony. Because, I mean, obviously he's going to be one of the finalists and he could easily win it. Um, but your thoughts on that play, Nevada? I thought that was unbelievable. I mean, there's about yeah. nine different options that you could do across that. I mean, McCord could keep off of that and then throw yeah. to the other wing back, you know, coming across the formation. I mean, there's so much going on right there. But that's, you know, something, that's the way that we should run our offense. And, and I, did, yeah. I just hope, I know we practice that stuff every week. I know that we've got that stuff in our playbook. You just hope that when we get up to Ann Arbor that Ryan just sticks with it and has the courage to stay with that stuff because, man, if we, we, we – present them with looks like that we get them not being predictable not running to a spot not being able to play downhill not being able to force us into you know third and long obvious passing types of situations where they could tee off and try to get to the spot man we're gonna be tough to beat and that that play was beautiful and and you know g scott i've been on him all yeah. year long and that was a heck of a block i mean that was a yeah. i mean he he went out there he turned on the dime went out there got on that guy's face and he made the block that made that play a walk in and uh, you know, kudos to him. And that was, uh, that was beautiful. That, that was probably my favorite play of the night just cause it was, it was beautiful and it was easy. And um, you know, I love stuff like that. I, I think if we run stuff like that, boy, boy, we're going to be tough to beat. I mean, I mean, runs like runs like that. It's kind of like urban's offense at Florida when, you know, they did a lot of misdirection and they had speed everywhere. So, I mean, you know, when you take one false step the wrong way and you get like, when they used to have like Jess, they have Jeff Demps and Percy Harvin, the guys are like the four, two guys, you take a false step, man, they're, they're going to the crib on you. And again, I love that kind of stuff. Cause it's hard to defend. Like when we put seven tight ends in or, or whatever, you would do those big heavy packages and everybody's that's what Michigan was doing against Penn state. And they're like, Oh my God, they've got seven offensive linemen in there. I'm like, dude, I would give anything to be able to go against that. Cause that means like when you, you know, they put, you know, one eligible guy and six guys that are in numbers from 50 to 79, those guys can't literally in college football, they're ineligible. Like in the NFL, you can report as eligible and you can be number 79 and catch a touchdown. You can't do that. Um, when you're on the line in college, if you're off the line, you can leak out and they can throw you a lateral, but, uh, that's it. We got some more super chats. Uh, AZ King, my dude, I appreciate you. You're always in here kicking it. Uh, <laughs> the um send off gif i love it uh, i appreciate you brother you're in here all the time too so we appreciate that uh scratch a few more of these and we'll get some more plays uh vince how likely is this is a great question how likely is the harsman for marv and do you think he's at least a lock for blitnikov i mean if he doesn't win the blitnikov i just i don't know what else you can do i mean i know that we're terrible at promoting these guys because again here's the deal and, and again I, people are like oh you're just bagging on you know your buddy at ohio state but it's like we had C.J. Stroud last year. He didn't win anything. I mean, how good is that guy? You, you, you guys, uh, is C.J. Stroud good? Is he better than Bryce Young? Is he better than Caleb Williams? Like, he didn't win anything. Paris Johnson, best tackle we've had since Orlando Pace. Not even close. Six overall pick. He wasn't even the Big Ten offensive line of the year. They gave it to the, the stiff from Northwestern who's playing guard for the Titans. Like, so at some point... It just becomes stupid. I mean, it's like it's like you almost have like the you know the Parker Fleming of uh, SIDs that are doing the job. Because I'm like, dude, you got to promote some of these guys. You know, Dewan Jones, like, I mean, he was an All American, but dude, he should have been up for the outlay. He should have been up for everything. Look how good Dewan is. So again, I know I know the deal. They can only promote so many guys, but like Marvin Harrison not winning, you know, the Blitnikoff last year was the craziest thing I've ever seen. A you know, fourth round pick that went to the New York Giants, who is the worst team in football, uh, who no one ever heard of, beat out Marvin. So. Again, it's what it is, you know. So there's my diatribe. Nevada, do you feel like Marwin is a block, a lock for the Blitnikoff? Well, he's got to win the Blitnikoff, and uh, you know, I, I mean, you look at his the odds. You know, the the, the gambling boards really like him as a, you know. So I, I think if, if if we win out, he wins the Heisman. I'll just say that. Yeah. If yep. we win out, he he wins the Heisman. I think he'll he'll get it over Bo Nix. He'll get it over Penix. Um, no. You know, a, a a the greatest player on the number one team in the country will just be irresistible. To yeah. the, the people, and it's not, you know, again, you know, it's not like wide receivers haven't won before. I mean, Devontae Smith, when I know his numbers were obscene and, yeah. and Marvin's aren't that, but I mean, Marvin's a force of nature. He's clearly the most dominant player in all of college football, and he should win the Heisman Trophy this year. So went out, and, and I think we've got another Heisman winner. Yeah. And, and again, I think statistics are obviously important. You know, everyone's going to compare across the board, but you know, the type of coverage, I mean, Marvin is getting, you know, I mean, they're putting him in a vice. I and mean, the teams do not want Marvin to beat you, especially when you lose a Mecca. So then, you know, the other guy is Julian Fleming, who's, you know, a guy that is probably a late round draft pick at best, maybe an undrafted guy. Uh, so they're going to do everything they can to stop Marvin Harrison. So Marvin's going to deal with that. But 
it honestly it reminds me of the year I, I looked it up. I don't know if it was in 04 or 05. It might have been, I think it was 04, the, the, the Fitzgerald year, or 03. It was one of those years in there where, where Fitzgerald was the best player in the world, ended up being, you know, a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, and they gave the Heisman to Jason White from Oklahoma. And I, I think that was the year that Jason, that they got absolutely crushed by USC uh, in the national championship. So that might have been 04. It was like 55 to like 10 or something in, in, down at the Orange Bowl. Um, but it's like, it's like that. Like, I mean, to me, like with the Heisman, I, you know, I never said that was a quarterback award, whatever, but you know, I think that it, uh, you know, if you have the chance to, to lock up a guy who's, who's, who's floor is, you know, like seven, eight time pro bowler and his ceiling is, you know, first ballot hall of famer. Like I'd rather have that guy in the association than Bo Nix. who's going to be you know, playing for the Winnipeg blue bombers next year. Um, Nevada, I, I I've thought about this. Uh, sometimes I talked to you about this. Is it interesting to you that the last two years and this year, the Heisman Trophy will be determined by the Ohio State-Michigan game? If you think about it, if CJ wins that two years ago, then he wins it last year, he's a two-time Heisman winner. And then this year with Marvin, if we beat Michigan, he's undefeated. Because you know, we'll play whoever. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know who's out of the West because I don't care. Um, but do you think it's interesting that, that it's come down to that the last three years? And he's on mute. I'll get him back in here. But I, I think it is. And, and in, in your uh, in your deal, I'd love to hear your, your comments on that. Do you think that the last three years we should have had three Heisman Trophies? I do. All right, here he, he's coming back in. Did you get my question? Nevada's back with us, I folks. Did, I did get your question. No, I just think it just it, – it, it, you know, I, I, I don't want to be redundant, but it just goes to show you how impactful – the stupid Connor Stallions cheating thing was over the past two years. I mean, it, it affected yeah. the, 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 the Heisman. Of, yeah. The Heisman. It affected. I mean, it, it affected so much, and it was you know for for the Michigan you know, fans to kind of come off with like like they're the aggrieved party now. That they're the victims. They're really the ones. That, it's like my God, you guys stole so much from so many people, and now you're caught, and now you're having to pay a little, a tiny little price. And you're complaining about it. It's just like, just you know, be, be happy because I'm telling you, it's going to get worse for you. It is yeah. going to oh, get yeah. worse for you. So right now, you're going to look back on this as the good old days. So you yeah. better enjoy every minute of this, even including Harbaugh, the TRO, the, the 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 national disgrace. This is as good as it gets for you guys right now. Yeah. So just yeah. enjoy enjoy your moment right now. Um, because it's it's not it's it's gonna get worse. I, I it's gonna get worse, and and you're gonna have to put away all your gear. You're gonna put away your gear and put it underneath the uh, underneath the, the closet in, in the the old you know hope chest and pull out your Central Michigan stuff and put it on. And you can all dress up like Connor Stallions and you know, walk around <laughs> like a like a CMU coach. And some of you can be Western Michigan coaches because Connor Stallions dress it up like a Western Michigan coach too. So um, yeah, you can do it all. But you ain't going to be yeah, with I, Michigan fans anymore because it's too embarrassing. I totally agree. The Super Chats are pouring in. We appreciate all you guys. Again, I love answering. You guys help make the show as good as anything. Because I'm telling you, you guys come up with fantastic questions. So big props to you guys. We love answering this stuff. Uh, culture of uh, by right. It's B-Y-R-T. Appreciate you. Thank you for the 10, brother. Culture of shrewdness developed at Michigan from untying. Yeah, I, I see. I, I agree. This is why I love the people that watch the show because you guys pick up on stuff like this. Untying Dobbins shoes, years of scouting. So, you know, you, you know, you, you watch, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen like the HBO documentary and what, you know, they're like jumping around in the tunnel, trying to fight us and scream. Cause we go, we go down that same stupid tunnel every single year and they're always there. They always got their cameras and like, you know, guys like Jake Ryan who played at St. Ignatius and wasn't breaking egg or jumping around screaming like they're from the hood. I'm like, dude, like you went to St. Ignatius. Like you're not, you're not scaring anybody. Um, playoff results. And that's not a shot. Cause you know, I've got really good friends at Ignatius, but you know, they ate caviar at lunch and you know, at Perry, we had to eat, you know, uh, ham sandwich with no crust, uh, playoff results last year show bucks better bucks for the win at the big house. Go bucks. I agree again. I, uh, but do you, do you agree with the culture of shrewdness of addicts? They have been, you know, uh, kind of greasy and I've noticed that. Well, look, I mean, if we were like that, I'd be embarrassed. I mean, I would, I just, I would Ab be embarrassed. Absolutely. I, I, like, I, what I, is I, that? I, I mean, I'd still be a fan. I I wouldn't turn in my fan card. I'd still wear my gear. I'd still be this, but I 
but I'd be embarrassed and I'd call it out. Oh. I would, I'd be like, oh. man, that's embarrassing. Embar- I mean, if the president of the university was, was tweeting out bet. Oh my God. I'd be, I, I'd be like, what, are, what are you 12 years old or something? You like eight, that? Yeah. You're 10 years old. Bet. Yeah, what are you, you more <laughs> bet. Oh, oh, look, I'm cool. Tom Brady, oh my bet. God. No, no, you guys are such morons, man. You're embarrassing. You guys stop. Yeah, I mean, it sucks being Bush League when you try to act like you're, like, you know, wine and cheese. So, uh, Rivia Tutube, appreciate you. Thank you for the 10. Uh, can we talk about the offensive line improvement? Sounds like Carson Hisman is doing well, right? Uh, Carson is getting better. I think his biggest issue was confidence. You know, again, it's I mean, it's been hot in that O-line room now. I'm telling you, you know, Ryan Day, again, you know, don't don't take uh, his kindness and his general approaches. He's not like I mean, he He gets after these guys hard. And I'm telling you, when you're in that in the Woody Hayes and you're a coach, if your unit is underperforming, I mean, I was there with Urban Meyer when I worked with Ed Warner. I'm like, dude, I don't know what we, we're going to do, whatever it takes to get this. We are not going to have the Eye of Sauron. You guys have seen Lord of the Rings, the Eye of Sauron, that big orange eye that like shoots fire and stuff. Like that was Urban Meyer. And Ryan has got a little bit of Eye of Sauron on him. So you do not want to be that underperforming position group that you know all the other units are looking at. Because again, last year, you know, for those last few games, that was the whole defense. So you had like, three different rooms you know you have the db room your linebacker room your, and your d-line room and those guys you know i mean th- that offense is looking like guys we scored like 42 points and you, we can't we still can't win really we scored 42 and you guys are still getting ran over like that so and again cheating georgia whatever but again you don't want to be in that in that unit that's being let down and again i think that was a massive motivation for that group because again that a lot of those guys are back the most talented guys are all back uh, and there are some guys that, frankly, shouldn't have been playing last year uh, that went on to do whatever, but they're not playing in the NFL. So I think that, you know, when you get whipped all offseason, man, it is tough in Columbus. Um, can we talk about the offensive line improvement? Yeah, I, Carson has been get better. Also, I haven't seen much from Emeka. Is it injuries or something else? No, I, I think Emeka is really beat up, you know, but I think that you hold him for another week and put him on glass. I mean, I know they've been trying to bring him back, but I don't know why. I mean, I think the only reason you play him at all is for conditioning, so that he's got some wind to him when he goes up to Ann Arbor. But your thoughts on the O-line, Nevada? Um, and also, uh, are you still worried, uh, like all of our uh, all of the crack geniuses uh, that reported uh, from an open practice that the second-team offensive line did not look good and we have no chance to ever win ever again? Yeah, no, that was bad. <laughs> bad take. Bad take. But, no, the O-line now, you know, Ohio State's – They've repped Matt Jones recently at center. Just so you guys know, they've repped Matt Jones at center, moving you know Enoch and, and George Fitz to uh, to guard there, you know to to fill it in. So they've been kind of you know pushing on on Carson there to kind of step up. And other than that that butt snap that he had, I thought he played really well. I thought he's played yeah. really well the last couple of weeks. But they've looked at shuffling some things there in terms of doing it. But I, I like what the offensive line's doing. But the offensive line is always going to look better when we stop calling loser plays. So, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, that the offensive line looked totally fine on that play that we broke down earlier in the, uh, in the show where we've got guys going left and guys going right. And, and, you know, you know wing backs pirouetting in a, a orbit motion. And a, I mean, that, that's, but if you run into a mass front with nine guys and we're probably not going to look great. So yeah. I think it's directly scheme related. Um, but they've been trying to light a fire under Carson. You know, they want more production out of him. He's a little light, but uh, I think he's been playing better. And, the, and as a result, the entire offense line, and let, let's face it, when you have Trey Henderson back there, the entire offensive line looks better because yep. Trey, if, if you watch Jameer Gibbs play for the Detroit Lions, that is <laughs> who Trey Henderson is, and that's who yes. he'll be at the next level. I mean, he is an elite NFL running back. He's going to be terrific in the league. And so enjoy him as well while we have him because uh, Michigan doesn't have a Trey Henderson, and we do, and then that could very well be the difference uh, up in Ann Arbor in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and, and like it, it was amazing at like the middle of the season, people are saying, "Oh, he stinks, no vision, whatever." And I'm like, "Dude, like you guys are total idiots." He has like fractured ribs right now, and he's waiting for his ribs to heal so he can come back and play because the dude is an absolute warrior. He's a tough kid, and he is. If there's one thing that you love. As an offensive lineman, again, I played offensive line. I love the offensive line. The one thing I love as an offensive lineman is a great elite tailback. Like Maurice Claret, Beanie Wells, Antonio Pittman, Ezekiel Elliott. Because those guys make you look so good. Because, again, they, they don't need – you don't need to knock guys back 12 yards for those guys to get yardage. Those guys, they find a sliver. And guys like Ezekiel, man, they hit the jets. And it's, they're going to the crib, you know. And so Beanie was like that. 
you know, again, I, I blocked for other guys and I, I blocked for Beanie and it's like, give me Beanie, give me Antonio Pittman. You know, I, you know, I, I talked to uh, Brace Claret a lot and like, I was like, dude, I would have loved to block for you. Cause he was an absolute monster back there. Uh, his, his freshman year obviously won the national championship. Um, Shelby, appreciate you, brother. If you have a question, let me know. Uh, thank you for the five. David Penteric, our dude. Appreciate you, brother. As always, David Penteric, the first subscriber to BuckeyeScoop.com, uh, which, you know, again, if you guys want the best inside information, you guys love this podcast. Like, you, this podcast is an hour every day. Buckeye Scoop is 24 hours a day like this, except we're on there constantly. You know, new information, new nuggets. Bill Green's on there doing recruiting stuff. Um, I don't know how you cannot be on it because it is an absolute blast. I spent all day on it. Uh, Taterbuck, appreciate you, brother. You've been in here a lot. Thank you so much. Do you think Ryan Day is spotlighting Mar is going to spot? Oh, absolutely. Ryan Day, again, this is the weird part about Ryan Day and, and our and our our crap promotions group that we have at Ohio State is that Ryan does everything he can to win these guys' awards, but you have to promote them. You have to promote these guys. You have to like Orlando Pace, I'm gonna find the photo of the pancake magnet. Um Steve Snap, who's the greatest SID that's ever lived for my book, he made little pancake. You know, this is, and Steve Snap didn't have YouTube. He didn't have a, 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 an entire 20 person camera crew, creative team putting out slick highlight videos. Steve Snap had to do it like basically like in the Stone Age. And he came up with these little pancake magnets. He sent them to every Heisman voter. So, you know, you get that in the mail and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's a little stack of pancakes with pace on it. And it's a magnet, so I'll throw that on my fridge. So every time you go into the fridge, you get you a Diet Coke, you get you some spare ribs or whatever you like to eat, you see that big pace thing, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then all of a sudden, he has to be fourth in the Heisman as a tackle, which is impossible. You know, I mean, you don't see offensive linemen get invited to the Heisman, but he was so masterful at marketing and promoting that he got him there. So um, what do you think, Nevada? I mean, obviously, I think Ryan's going to just – I mean, Marvin's going to get 15, 20 targets. You know, he's – Ryan's a lot like – Kyle Shanahan, like Kyle Shanahan today, I was watching the 49ers uh, versus the Jaguars game. Cause I have McCaffrey in one league and I have Purdy in a league and I was watching them and like, they have all the starters pulled and they're down in the red zone and like Christian McCaffrey's in the game, but like Trent Williams is out, Purdy's out, Ayuk's out, Kittle's out. They got all the AYOs, all the guys that you know were on the, the plane that normally don't play. They're all in the game. And then Christian McCaffrey and he's throwing the ball to Christian McCaffrey when he's up like 38 to three. And I'm like, why is he still in the game? And you know, cause I don't want him to get hurt. And it's cause he had like a 17 game touchdown streak. He's trying to keep it alive. So coaches, you know, they like to, you know, if there's a streak or a uh, most 100 yards or whatever, they like to dial that up. And, and cause again, it looks good on the data sheet when you've got those voters looking at here's the top candidates for awards, but your thoughts on that Nevada. Yeah. I mean, Ryan Day's done that almost to a fault. I mean, you know, to a where he's kept guys in and yep. you know, Stroud, totally agree. Keep Stroud in 50, nothing games. And, yeah, and never developed the backups. But, you know, look, I, I don't think what happened on Saturday night was a cosmic accident. They were making a concerted effort to feed Marvin, to kind of feature Marvin, and it worked. I mean, Marvin literally in game, the odds on Marvin Harrison to win the Heisman dropped from like 14 to 1 to 4.5 to 1 in the first quarter. Jeez. Four. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it worked. And like you said, you know, it, it, now, I mean, you, you've got Gus Johnson calling him Maserati Marvin. I mean, that's the oh, easiest. Of course. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. Association of the world, do the Maserati yeah. thing, picture of him in the car, and yeah. I mean, th this this doesn't have to be particularly complicated, but no. like you said, we're just we're just not good at it. That's why all the bosses. We could go through the list of guys. Oh, oh my! Let, let's, 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 the bosses. They got beat up by Scooter McDo or Scooby Wright, or I'm like Scooby Wright beat out Joey Bosa in what Scooby universe oh my god i i remember i was going to town on twitter back in the day this is before i was i was really on site and like it was funny because mark pantoni sent me a text saying uh he got like a a, a thing from one of the the people at arizona they said it's really poor that one of your gas is is uh insulting our player who won the award over post and and i told him i was like Give him my number. I'll say it to his face. I think he's an idiot. I mean, Joey Bo I mean, and Joey proved me right. I was like, this is an absolute tragedy. And again, Joey doesn't care. He's going to make $250 million in the league. Scooby's out of the league in five minutes. But I, I just, I mean, Pay Tony sent me that. I'm like, dude, for one, tell him I'm not a GA, you know, and tell him to come see me. I don't care. You give him my phone number. But again, but I was right. Because again, usually when I like, when I go like that far off the rails, like it's because I'm a thousand percent right. And I was. So, we guess, God, these are piling up. I appreciate you guys so much. What a great night. Tony Turley, as for <laughs> the cheating team up north, I love it. I love that I had to figure that out at first, but now I really love it. Leaving the Big Ten. I don't think 
the, the Mac will want to program that dirty. I mean, the Mac, the Mac is the Mac is the Mac. And again, you know, when you're at the Mac, you don't have like 25 compliance officers and dedicated folks. I mean, the Mac, the Mac, the Mac, the Mac can get down now when it comes to get some stuff done. I mean, again, they let Connor Stallings on the sideline. They didn't know who he was. I mean, I mean they, they, the Central Michigan still hasn't said that that was him. I mean, they, he's saying, they think it thought it was, but it was just like, I mean, Nevada, are you surprised Central Michigan has not come out and said, yes, that was Connor Stallions. Yes, the person that gave him their credential was fired. Uh, case closed. Well, I mean, they, they have told the Big Ten that, and they have told the NCAA that. They just haven't come out with it publicly because it's part of the uh, the – the investigation, the ongoing investigation, but yeah, I mean, what a black eye for their program. And I don't buy for a second that they didn't know he was on the sideline. Of course they knew he was on the sideline. All those guys have ties to Michigan. McElwain's ties to Michigan. They knew exactly what was going on with that. I don't believe for a second that he just snuck onto the sideline with a stolen no. pass and in the outfit. They, they all knew. They all knew that he was, he was there as we talked about to try out his stuff, to do a test run, and to help Central Michigan. Central Michigan was leading in that game 7-3 yes. with 49 seconds to go in the first half. So yeah. like, he was there He was there for a reason, guys. It wasn't just to take the game in, I'm telling you. Yeah, he wasn't just there to eat the pregame meal and get the postgame snack. He was there to actually help. Because, again, Michigan State stinks. And there's years where a good MAC team could easily beat Michigan State or easily beat the middle to lower tier. And it's happened. I mean, dude, Michigan lost to Toledo less than 20 years ago. So, I mean – in football, if a team stinks, anything can happen. Um, didn't you, didn't you have a great one against a MAC team with, with a great Ohio State team, like some like like a three nothing game at halftime or three two or no three or, two or, or, against 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 Akron. We, uh, 2007, when we were number one in the country, we were beating Akron three to two because we sucked. We we just weren't we played like trash that day. So it's like we ended up beating them. I don't know if it was like twenty one to three, but again, that's why like when people are like, oh, we didn't do good. Oh, the O line's not good. Oh, I'm just like. Guys, like, I just want to win every game by one point and then flush it down the toilet, move on to the next week, and, and, pray, and pray to God that nobody gets hurt. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't sit around like, oh, we only won by 40 and, oh, we didn't cover. It's like, you know, it just, I don't care. I just want to win. If we win every game by one this season, we'll be the happiest human beings on earth because we'll be the national champions. Uh, I got to show the pancake magnet real quick, and then we're going to go right back to the Super Chest because we're falling out. So our boy Steve Snap, who's a genius, he's in the Ohio State Hall of Fame, God rest his soul. Came up with this old doohickey magnet. Again, this thing looks like it was made by, you know, in five minutes by some intern. But he sent this to every Heisman voter. And sure as could be, Orlando Pace, the left tackle, you know, number one overall pick of the draft, you know, got invited to the Heisman. And, and again, that's like, you know, when you think in the pantheon of, of o and how many go to the Heisman, I mean, there's, I don't, I don't know how many have gone since Orlando, maybe less than three or four or two. I don't know. But, you know, Ohio State had Hicksy, John Hicks finished second, and Pace finished fourth. And again, it's because they're good at promoting this. And again, at Ohio State, it's like it's not like it's that hard to get promotion because you're on primetime TV. You're the biggest brand in college football. You get the highest ratings every single week. Anytime anyone plays you, we play like Notre Dame, we smash every rating ever. So it's just not that hard, but you have to be good at it. Um, next, we go to all right, Team Up North chat. Marv will make history in the cheating in game. I appreciate this, Terry. Thank you for the five. I think he could, man. I think, you know, I think he's the X factor every week, but man, I just, I like the matchups, man. I love Marvin in that game. I think about the great receivers. I think about Santonio San Holmes up there in 05. Uh, some of the plays he made, you know, little Teddy. Um, Marvin, Marvin's got a shot to do that. Your thoughts on that, Nevada? Yeah, no, I mean, look, it's, it, it's, it's so hard to defend because like you said, you know, you want to take away Marvin Harrison, but if you, if you really commit, to taking away Marvin Harrison, then you've got to contend with Trey Henderson and, and other guys out there. So, yeah. like, defenses are really perplexed because, you, you know, you can't play with 13, 14 guys out there. You only can have 11. You can't double-team everybody. And yeah. at some point, you know, you're going to identify, you're going to identify Marvin you know, on an island against somebody, and he can cook those Michigan defensive backs. Because those yeah. guys, they're not only they don't they don't have Sauce Gardner back there. They don't have no. Revis Island. You know what I'm saying? Like, that. No. They're, they're just guys. And um, and Marvin can cook, guys. No, I, I, I totally agree. Um, Shelby, appreciate this, my man. Is Mike Hall a liability uh, versus run? I I think he is. He's very hit and miss just because of his size. Again, you know, not everybody can do everything because you know those guys that are defensive tackles. 
that are liability in the pass rush too. Like, you know, some of those really big fat guys that are slow. Uh, I'm sure you, you see the big NFL guys, like they only plan first and second down. Once it's time to go get after that passer, you know, they're running, they're, they're running off the field to get a, a quick, a quick little short uh, twitchy guy in. But you know, I don't know if, if he's a total liability because he he gets some tackles for a loss now. He, I mean, he'll he'll shoot the gap. I think that he's playing in his gaps more this year because I'm sure that they told him that's why I didn't play last year. Um, but I, I just think he's a, a fantastic player and he's going to be a high pick. And you know, he's he's just, his his dynamic skill set of being a pass rusher um, to me outweighs him being a liability against the run. But your thoughts on that, Nevada? Yeah, I mean, he's a mixed bag. There's no question about it. I mean, it's, it's yeah. clearly not his strong suit, and I think it's probably the reason why we've been susceptible to the power running game. It's because he's he's a little undersized. He's a little light, probably, probably what, what, 265, 270, whatever it is. And yeah. um, But, you know, for, for a game like this, for a challenge like this, this isn't unnoticed by him. He's not going to go into this game and be like, wow, I didn't have any idea they're going to be running power at me. I didn't have any idea – that I'm going to be the linchpin to the defense. I mean, he's being oh. challenged. They they know none of this is going to be a surprise to anybody when we get up there. And yeah. I just have confidence that they'll be able to to deal with that, to address with you know, to you know, play to the guy's strengths and to take away the things that Michigan wants to do and make them try to do the things that they don't want to do. And I think that's always the secret to great defense. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, Tom Gumbar, appreciate you. Thank you for the five, brother. Uh, Kirk Penn State was running the ball with some success between the tackles. I agree they were. Um, and and their their interior is vastly inferior to what we got. I mean, because Matt Jones has been killing it this year. He'll probably be first team all Big Ten. Donnie's playing better. Uh, Carson, again, Carson's only a second year guy. So it's not like I'm down on him, but he's just young. I mean, sometimes, you know, as you get a little bit older, get some grown man strength, you know, he's got to go live in that squat rack and get that lower body developed because he's got to push guys around um, a little bit more. How do you think Hinsman will fare and can Trey have a big game? I think. I think Trey's the X factor to the whole team, honestly. I think against Michigan, like you got to be able to run the ball. Uh, a guy like Trey, uh, you know, again, when you go on the road in the Big Ten, and especially if you go to Ann Arbor, you pack your running game, you pack that defense, you know, and our defense is absolutely the best in the country. They're absolutely nasty. I've heard everyone talk about Penn State, Michigan, Georgia, every other team. There isn't a defense in the country if they get over Ohio State right now. And those guys, they've got a lot of confidence, they're playing with a lot of energy. Uh, they believe in the scheme. Uh, and, and again, you know, they, they've got it, the, the, the least talked about thing that they have a ton of in spades is leadership. Like they have guys like Tom Eikenberg. They've got Josh Proctor, who's playing uh, all American level safety. You know, Josh Proctor is one of my favorite Buckeyes of all time because he's the only Buckeye in the universe that would, you know, get done like last year, get benched after one quarter, never play again, and stay for a six year in the era of the portal. And he is absolutely balling. So, you know, he's a guy. The Michigan does that run game. Proc's the guy that could be an eraser back there because he he has zero fear of anything. Um, uh, your thoughts on that? Are running it in between the tackles? I think we could do it. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I thought Penn State was having a lot of success with that, and you know, again, you know, you know, they don't have the guys that we have, and they don't they don't have the you know the elite talent and the you know, the elite breakaway ability that we have at running back and. So no, I, I think I think Michigan be, can definitely be had, and it's just going to come down to you know Ryan just having the confidence and and being that fearless play caller that we know that well look we saw it in the Georgia game last year, I mean he he let it all hang out against Georgia and that was beautiful to watch. You just just got to do it, just trust it, trust the game plan, go out there, let it all hang out. I think we're going to be just fine. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, Mike Jarrett, uh, thank you for the five. Appreciate you, brother. Sick of the SEC ESPN promoting average turds for Heisman. I totally agree. Uh, <laughs> look like one of the biggest Desmond the Cheetah. Desmond Desmond is the dumbest human being on TV. I mean, I mean, he is just. Uh, and, and again, I have no idea why he's on there. I mean, he is so impossibly bad. His predictions are so bad. It's like he doesn't study anything. He just shows up and he smiles. And he says dumb stuff. I mean, I can't even watch this because they don't have a single notable person. Like they got rid of David Pollock, who's actually really good, you know, and, and you know, to turn it into the circus with McAfee. And again, McAfee is a money making machine. I get it. You know, he, the circus is in town, uh, but you know, he does bring eyeballs. It's because you never know what he's going to do or say, or it's going to be shirtless or, you know, doing the rebel yell or whatever. But uh, Desmond Howard is, is impossibly stupid. And I have no idea why he's on any sort of TV. Um, you know, this is what's probably Yeah. I, well, that's the funny thing is like these Michigan guys, they're so like despondent that I think that the only way they can stick together is just rally 
and say, oh, we didn't cheat. Oh, we didn't cheat. Like, and I'm like, guys, like, this is going to get really bad for you guys. You know, this is like, it, you know, I mean, right now, like, if you're, you know, um, it, it, if you're trying to defend Michigan, it's like defending like Jeffrey Epstein at this point. It's just so obvious what was going on, how bad it was. Um, but if you're a lunatic, like like their fan base is, then it is what it is. Uh, your thoughts on that, Nevada? Yeah, I just look. They, they've obviously kind of gone in with this. We're the aggrieved party. We're the victims. Everybody's you know mean and and they're bullying us and they don't understand us and they don't appreciate us. And for, for Michigan fans, that resonates with them. They, you know, if you think about the kind of person who is a Michigan fan, that kind of victim mentality really plays to them really well. They, 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 they live for that. So that's not just a Michigan football thing. That's a life thing. That's how they live their life. And so this, this for them, this is, you know, Purina cat chow for all these guys out there. They're like, <laughs> oh, my God, this, this is the greatest thing. We're just lapping it up right now. Just like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, my God. You know, oh yeah, we're the victims. Of, and, and you know what we're going to do? We're going to leave the conference. We're going to leave the conference oh, now. Please, please leave. Please leave. Be the greatest thing leave. ever. Please leave. Go to the SEC and go play Georgia and Bama. You guys would be you guys would be beat no, to they're, death. They're not, they're not even talking about going there. They're, 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 that's the thing. Even in their fantasies, they don't go to the <laughs> no, SEC. They're, no. they're like, we'll, we'll go to the ACC. It's like, oh, yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, go, they, ahead, go, the, go play go NC the, State. The, no, they need to go to the AAC or something like that. Go to one of those. Yeah. Go play Connecticut or something like that. Oh, my God. It's so stupid. Uh, yeah, I remember this like yesterday. App- Appy State, uh, we beat Youngstown State that day. They played Appy State. So it was like when we started playing one double A schools and Appy State beat them. I'll never forget. I was in the press conference um, post game because uh, back then, like it was the captains and Tress were the first guys up at the mic after every game. And we're in there watching this. And, you know, the, the beat, you know, the beat, it's funny because like the beat writers are all kind of fanboys. Like they're just, it's kind of what they are. And it was very like funny because like as the. Did you say did did you say fat boys? You said fat boys. No, <laughs> some of them are, but they're fanboys. So it's okay. like we're we're watching oh, that game. I thought, you, and I, I thought you said <laughs> I thought you said fat boys. <laughs> oh, they're gonna they're they're not gonna like me. I don't know what I'm ever gonna do with myself. <laughs> um, but anyways, like we're watching that, and man, when that when that kick got blocked, because Sean Crable doesn't know how to like defend. Uh, he doesn't know how to play the wing, and I coached the wing, and it's like it was like he was asleep, you know, at the as a switch, and Corey Lynch darted through there and blocked that thing. That place erupted. And actually, you know, I frankly thought it was kind of cool because I was like, man, these guys actually really like like us. They're kind of, you know, they root for us a little bit, you know, until we do something bad and then they just crucify us, but whatever. Um, but no, that was uh, that was one of the worst losses ever. But I mean, Appy State back in the day, it I mean, they were monsters in one double A. You did I mean, they were like Alabama, you know, like 10 years ago. I mean, they they were juggernauts. So, you know, you, you can say what you want about like playing in Appy State, but I don't want to play those guys. Like when they were that like that, I don't want to play those guys. No way. Cause you know, when you play a team like that, that's usually the best team in their conference, maybe the best team in one double a. So they're like national champions. They're a veteran. They had Armani Edwards who's fantastic. And was a second round pick in the NFL. Like normally when you're scheduling a cupcake, you ain't trying to play no second round pick that can run a four, three, but they did. And they paid the price for it. Um, another super chat, Jeremy G appreciate you, a brother just tuned in. You guys are the most of the most, Educational, entertaining channels. Appreciate that. As well as, again, we work really hard to try to make people smarter. And we try to break stuff down, make it easy, have fun. You know, love the qu- the questions are always, like, fantastic. Because, you know, you help us be better at this by tuning in and and commenting and giving us questions. Because then we know what you guys want. So that's what we try to, to give you guys uh, in spades. So we appreciate that. Uh, PSU had an offense with a pulse. They went Bucks 31-16. I, I agree. I mean, I, I just think, you know, the offensive coordinator literally got fired with like two days to go or two games to go or whatever it is. I mean, their season's over. I know they got some worthless bowl game they go to, but like I was watching that and I was like, that guy makes a million dollars to call the swinging gate for one. I don't know why they go for two there. I thought, you know, I know analytics are like everyone's like favorite thing in the world. Oh, run analytics, analytics. But it's like, you know, if I want to go get a sandwich in my kitchen, the analytical people will say, well, jump out of your window. Cause that's faster than taking the stairs. And I'd be like, well, I'm going to break my leg probably, but at least I get, I get to the ground faster, but the analytics aren't always right. I know everyone's obsessed with them, but it was stupid. But um, your thoughts on that. Does Penn State, what if they have an offense, Nevada? Well, 
there's so much to break down there. First, going for two in that situation. I'm talking about the first time that they went for two early yeah. in the game. Dumb. Yeah. Never chase Dumb. points. Don't don't chase yeah. points. Uh, the only time to chase points is when you feel like there's only going to be a limited number of scores in the remaining game, like one yes. or two. You're trying to get to a prime number. To chase points in the first half. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Nobody can ever convince that. Forget the analytics. It's just dumb. So let's put yeah. that aside. Secondly, firing your six the day after the game is like <laughs> literally, that's the greatest thing ever. It's like you're basically saying the reason we lost is this this guy was so bad. I can't wait till the end of the year. I can't wait till the the, the, the Bulls. I can't, I, he's got to be gone now. He was that bad. And you know what? Franklin, fire yourself, man. Yes. Go, you, you're the one. You're the problem, James. You're the common He's denominator. Also two. Go for two. You're, like, I mean, you're the one that he, you do all the stuff, but then you, you, you blame this poor uh, Jamoke that goes out there as the uh, offensive coordinator. But Franklin, you're you're a joke, man. You're terrible. You beat you've beaten one top five team in 15 tries, and that was that stupid game where you guys cheated and pulled the guy and blocked the extra point or the field goal rather and beat yeah. Ohio state. And it's just, you know, that saved your job, which frankly has been good for Ohio state. Cause look, all this stuff's been good for Ohio state. Him still being there is great because Penn state's permanently mediocre. Mm -hmm. Him losing this weekend to Michigan guys, Ohio state fans. That was better for us. It was better for us. It was, yeah, it, it opens it was. up the possibility that a number one Ohio state team, if you lose a close game up at Ann Arbor, you ain't falling past four. Nah. You're not going to fall to five. You, you'll stay nope. in the top four, and you'll go to the playoff, and you'll have a chip and a chair. And an Ohio State team in the playoff, as we saw last year, is a very dangerous proposition. So what happened this weekend, we wanted it to happen. So we really owe a, a, a thing of thanks to James Franklin for being so ass, my dude, because you were. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, James. On behalf of all of Ohio State fans. Oh, thank, I totally thank you. I to totally agree. Uh, Spook Jr., this is a great one. Five bucks. Thank you so much, brother. Can Daylight at all hang out with McCord against the team up north like he did with Stroud against Georgia? I mean, dude, I, again, I you guys know where I stand on the quarterback run. It's the it's it's that ex, it's that fourth dimension in the offense where all of a sudden, uh, you know, Kyler Murray's back today and magically, you know, when they need it the most, they need to convert and get a field goal. He scrambles to get a first down for 13 yards. They kick the field goal. They win the game. Like, it happens every single week. Like if you guys want to remember one thing I say all the time, look how hard it is to defend a quarterback that runs. Now again, this is not you know Urban Meyer, Tim Tebow run you know QB power in the A gap, get the quarterback killed. It is not that. But if it is there and they are double teaming Marvin and they're in man coverage and they get their back against you and there's a lot of green grass in front of you and you can run and go get a big chunk of it, go get eight yards, make it second and two. Make it second and one. Convert on it. Again, if you guys want to see the greatest scrambling in Ohio State history, go watch Troy Smith in the second half of the 05 Michigan game up there. He saved us countless times. He had the greatest scramble in Ohio State. I mean, he was running to the sticks. Lamar Woodley, who's the best end that's played in Michigan, in for, he, he was better than Hutchinson for my money. I mean, he was really good. Um, had, had him dead to rights at an angle. And, like, it was amazing. Troy just, like, stopped. And Lamar Woodley goes flying past him into the sideline. And then Troy like takes like two steps and walks out of bounds past the marker. So, you know, again, we don't win any of the Michigan games, especially in 04, 05 without Troy's legs. Uh, but what do you think? Do you think, you think McCord will open it up and run a little bit? I hope so. I mean, look, yeah. frankly, the only thing that scares me about McCarthy is his legs, not his arm. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. And when Michigan needs a big play, almost in – Doubtably, what they're going to do is they're going to run McCarthy. They they'll they'll run, you know, the, the quarterback run. I mean, they run him like we used to run JT Barrett. They, you know, that's the whoopie for for Michigan. They love to run the quarterback. Um, he made a lot of big plays with his legs, you know, scrambling, getting first downs. So yeah, I I hope that they unleash full, you know, uh, Kyle. And that's really been one of the things that's really kind of been hurting about the Devin Brown injury. Um, is the fact that we don't really have a capable backup to Cal McCord right now. And I think that's got to be in the back of, of Ryan's mind in terms of limiting, you know, the number of times he's going to uh, allow him to take a hit. Because if he takes a hit, what are we going to do? Go to Lincoln, go to Tristan. Yeah, you know, that, I mean, that's, we, that's we, it. I mean, that, that's it right there. I mean, you can't, I mean, that's where, you know, but again, it's to me, it's, if it's open, take it and slide, do not absorb a blow. Um, but I, I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, you're going to have Lincoln Keenholz in there, you know, dealing it up versus the number two team in the nation or three team in the nation at that point. Um, no, but, but, but I agree. Uh, let's go back to the film room. We got a little bit more, uh, a couple more we'll break down. 
this was a dime. Uh, one of the best throws, maybe the best throw of Kyle McCord's career. And this was, yeah, this is the touchdown to Marvin. Drops right in the basket. Again, the chemistry. Marvin on his Monarch machine. It's like Marvin, you know, Marvin's obviously the best receiver. He might be, it's probably the best receiver in Ohio State history at this point. But, you know, and, and he's he's kind of cured the dropsies. But, I mean, there's no, there's no space here. And, again, this isn't bad coverage. Like, I mean, when you're the corner, this is when life sucks, is when you play Marvin Harrison and the quarterback is dialed in like this and he drops this thing with, like, an inch to spare and Marvin drags his feet and it's right in the basket. And you're just like... Like what? Like what? Like this guy's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, how do you defend? Like, I mean, what is he supposed to do? I don't know. But um, the thing I love about this one, so we run a full turn protection here. Uh, we got Trey back here. So Trey's back here, and this is a turn. This is a slide. Slide protection means that each lineman has the outside gap. So he's got this gap. He's got this. Uh, that's the C gap. He's got the B gap. He's got the A gap. He's got the other A gap. He's got the B gap. He's got the C gap. So Trey is looking for whatever's off his butt off his edge. So when you watch this, you know, the thing that stinks is uh, Josh Simmons is not good here. You know, and again, he's got he's got his inside gap and this guy swims outside of him. So really the tight end should have this, this D tackle right here. This should be the tight ends guy and this edge guy should be left for Trey. But instead, Trey, and this is something that when you're an NFL team, you evaluate how good are they in pass pro? How good is this guy in pass pro when you've got a guy making... 300 million at quarterback and, and you've got, you know, monsters coming off the edge and you got to block with the back. So Trey has to step up and he stones a big fat D tackle. I mean, this is, this is squat rack. This is in the gym, explosive power stones him and he gets enough of him. Now this is a, that guy probably outweighs Trey by a hundred pounds and he stops him instantly. I mean, that is Kyle, get rid of that ball boy. Cause I, I can't hold it in there for too long, but you know, we hang in there just enough. You know, I mean, Carson's going to be a little bit cleaner here. Um, but you know, we get it away and it's clear. And, and again, he doesn't have to move. I mean, he literally catches the ball, takes, you know, takes a hitch and chucks it and puts it right on the money. But you know, Trey is the star of that play. I know Marvin's catches, but you know, Trey is expecting edge pressure and he looks and he's got, Oh my God, a big fat D tackle right in my, in my face. And he stones him, which I think is fantastic. And again, that's like one of the first clips. If I was watching a Trey Henderson highlight tape, I'm like, okay, let's put this right at the top. Cause it, it shows that he can stand up versus a guy who's, hundred pounds heavier, big fat guy. Um, Cause you're not, you never put a tailback on a D tackle. That is a mismatch with the, it's kind of like putting him on like a really, really heavy D end. Like when Joey Bosa was 275, 280. Like, I mean, you don't want to put a back on that guy. You want to put him on the outside linebacker or if there's a safety or if there's a lighter defensive end, but you don't want to put him on a D tackle or a heavy D end. Cause he's going to get ran over. Uh, but your thoughts on that plane about it. Well, I mean, like you said, probably the best. I mean, that, that's like a, JT Barrett throw against Michigan State back in I think it was 15 or whatever. I mean that was just a beautifully thrown. I mean absolutely perfect. Nobody could throw the ball better than that. And for Trey, I mean Trey just plays the game really violently, man. I mean he runs violently, he blocks violently, he's always looking for contact. He's going so that's why it's been so funny where I hear people bagging on him, and I'm like, man, this kid. This, you know, and, and, and I, I don't want to get on Lydell Ross, but Lydell Ross is like the anti Trey, you know what I'm saying? The guy's Ooh. skittering out of bounds. I mean, Trey is running out there Ooh. looking for guys to just run through. And uh, you would think that Ohio State fans would just love a guy like this. They would just be like, oh my God, this is our guy. And for some reason, he just never connected with the fan base. And I, I, I it, it's probably one of the more perplexing things that I've ever seen in all my years watching because he does everything that you want. I mean, he, he runs, he's elite, he can catch and he blocks. He just blows people up when he blocks. And, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to be sad when he's gone because, um, we don't have another Trey Henderson in the room. I'm telling you that. No, we, we, we really don't. And that's the thing is people don't realize how good he's until he's gone. Um, Duncan Watt, appreciate you, brother. Uh, this I this is amazing. I love you guys. Uh, we love you guys too, man. We appreciate all you guys that tune in. Again, this is this is fun for Nevada. Like when we do this, I mean, we talk all day, but I'm like, we can't wait to you know we're texting back and forth ideas for the podcast. What we need to talk about. Let's break down some plays. Uh, but we love doing this. We really appreciate you guys when you you guys show us love like that. Thank you for the ten. Uh, you're my only go to Buckeye coverage. Again, if if you remember Buckeyescoop.com, I mean, we're on that thing 24 hours a day. So it's like it's like you're all, we're always on the grind on that so if you guys aren't members it's a great uh christmas present i'm just telling you it's around the season you guys don't need any more ties you guys don't need any more air fryers get buckeyesgroup.com uh but when you say trey has vision i think you don't know the meaning of the term plow the road for him and he's great see i i disagree just because i 
you know, again, I, I lived in the world of guys that, I mean, I've played with running backs that don't have vision. I've played with running backs that have fantastic vision. I mean, the guy that was the best, best I've seen um, at reading the power play was Maurice. I mean, when Maurice Collette ran, I mean, and I actually sat and watched Craig. Um, Craig was watching film one day when I was a freshman and I sat and watched with Craig Krenzel, like, and he just talked about how this guy could see everything and like, he could see things because it's not just seeing what is happening. Like at that millisecond, it's like, what's kind of about to happen in like the, the next nanoseconds to go by you. Cause you gotta like read big, big 300 pound dudes, uh, double teaming a front side guy. And you know, what's the matchup like on the backside? Are we going to launch that guy? Is he a light guy? Uh, and Maurice would see that stuff, man. And, and plus also, um, it has a little bit to do with your pass pro, but it's mostly just that it's mostly interior run stuff. Like you don't need a lot of vision to run outside zone, but you're on that interior stuff where it's murky and dark and nasty. Like, that's where you have to know when to roll it back, cut it to the backside, keep it front side. Um, I think Trey's got great vision, honestly. And you know, and I and I welcome, you know, if you uh if you feel different, but again, I, I think that is he the best ever? No. I mean, that's Maurice, Ezekiel, those guys, but I think he's better than a lot of these guys. I mean, and because the, the contrary, and I don't like to bang on Master T just because Master is like one of the nicest kids of all time, one of the greatest teammates of all time. But like Master literally had no vision. He ran with his eyes closed and he would run it up the backs of guys and you know, Carlos Hyde was like that earlier in his career, too. He would just run up the backs of guys. But, uh, Nevada, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, again, I think it's way better than people think. I think that, you know, Trey, uh, I just, I mean, look, he's going to be a high draft point. He'll be the first running back taken in the in the, in the the college draft this year. He'll go on to the NFL. Um, he'll be an uber-productive back. Uh, if he gets in the right system, he'll be an elite uber-productive back. So, I, you know, vision is one of those things that, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder and people can say what they want and say what they, I just, you know, to me, it's so obvious that this guy is really one of the keys that, you know, that everything picks up when he's in there and everything slows down when he's not. Um, yeah. that's, that's all I really have to know about his vision or, or about his anticipation. Um, but. I, I I think he's I think he's I think he's elite across the board in, in every possible way that you'd want a running back to be elite. Um, you know, I, do I wish that he had been healthy and never been injured? Yeah, but he play he plays violent. He plays a violent position and he plays yeah. it violently. And when that happens, those those guys those guys sometimes get hurt. But he's not hurt now, and it, and uh, I'm enjoying every minute of it. I mean, like my my favorite running back to watch on film, you know. Adrian Peterson. I mean, he was as violent of a runner as ever existed. And like he, you know, he got hurt. You know, he get hurt sometimes. But like when a guy runs like that, I mean, you never saw Adrian Peterson take a playoff. I mean, that guy, you know, he'd be at practice throwing a Copenhagen and just run through people, run through people's faces. I mean, he's dropping the shoulder, uh, took care of himself. I mean, like those are the kind of guys and, and Trey dropped. Like when I saw Trey as a freshman, drop the shoulder and run a dude over, despite being like more of a, like a speed back. I, I was just like, I'm in love. I love the I love the physicality. Don't ever lose it. Don't ever cower or protect yourself. Because the only thing about football is you can't protect yourself. As soon as you try to protect yourself, you're gonna get hurt. You know, unless you're a quarterback and you can slide, but otherwise you just gotta go play ball. Um hey Meadows, appreciate you, my man, uh, for the two. Do you think Devin Brown is good to go for that team or north? I think he will be. Um again, you know, he's in a boot working along, but I think uh you know, he's going to be, he'll be good. I think there's going to be a lot of guys working to get back. And that's the benefit to the way the schedule sets up with Michigan State and Minnesota is you can hold guys. You know, I don't know if I'd even played Cade, but I'm sure Cade, you know, you got to remember when you're Cade Stover and you have two shots left in the horseshoe ever to play, uh, you, you're going to try to get that last, that second to last one in because their next game on Saturday is senior day. They're never going to play the horseshoe again, which it's sad and melodramatic and whatever, but it just kind of is what it is. Uh, your thoughts on that, Nevada? Will Devin Brown be good to go uh, for that team up north? Boy, you know, it's just, I, I mean, I hope so. You know, I mean, thought he was yeah. good to go. I mean, he, he apparently, he, you know, when you're talking about ankles, it's just so hard. It's so hard to know because you can wake up tomorrow and, and it can be better. Or you can wake up tomorrow and it can be ballooned up like a like a watermelon. You just don't know. So what, what I think so, yeah, but we're going to have to monitor this week and, and see where he's at, and then you know, check his availability. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Let's put it this way: I, I'm hopeful, and there, there's no reason to believe that it's anything long term. It's just a question of you know how effective he can be and and how quick he can get out there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, a Willis, appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the five. If the 
Big one had hurt that cheating team up north, that che- the cheaters up north. Last week, they would have suspended James Franklin. Ooh, that is spicy. I mean, well, I mean, Franklin, I don't know. He, uh, I, 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 I just, I don't have words. I think he's the biggest fraud in college football, but he's employed and, you know, he, he, you know, he's smooth talker or whatever, I guess, but I just, I don't, I've never seen it with that guy. Penn State, I think, is, you know, a, a not a sleeping giant because there's not great talent in Pennsylvania anymore. And it's not a big national brand. They kind of get the, they were way better. Like, you know, when I was there, they kind of had a little renaissance. But in the mid 90s, like 94, that Penn State team was as good as any team's ever played. You know, in 2000, 2000, like that 99 season when they had Arrington and Courtney Brown and those guys, I mean, they were legit. But they've never really been great on offense. You know, they, they kind of, I always call their fans, their fans are like the cicadas because it's like every 20 years they show up and they make a bunch of noise and then they go back into hibernation for 20 years. Like Penn State fans are the ultimate cicadas because they suck for like 10 years. They'll beat us one time on like a fluke play and then, you know, we have to hear about it forever. Like that's the thing. The funny thing about being like an Ohio State like supporter or a fan is that when a team beats you like one time in the last 20 years, Every time we play them, it's like they have to go back and show like that, like that high. Like when we play Wisconsin, they show, oh, here's the 2010 game, the JJ Watt game. You know, there's like almost no players left from the NFL still in the NFL because that game was so long ago. Or you know, the Penn State, they always go to the 16 game because they because we beat them like five or six or seven times in a row, and they're like, oh, we got to go back to the one time they actually beat us. So it's just almost funny at this point how dominant we've been over this. So what about I think we can wrap this thing up. This has been a fantastic show. Thank you guys. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, no, just going to be an exciting week. Uh, kind of sad. This this group is going to be the last time we're going to see them in the horseshoe, but going to enjoy the game and, and getting ready for the big one. Uh, the good news about a game like this is you don't have to worry about overlooking this team and getting ready for uh, the game. But, you know, I mean, Michigan's playing at, at Maryland. I mean, yeah. and, and I'm not saying that they're going to lose at Maryland, but, like, that's a lot more challenging than playing Minnesota in oh, the yeah. horseshoe. So, uh so no, I think the schedule set up perfectly. Um, if you if you bet, you know, uh, over ten and a half wins in the regular season, go go to the window and cash your ticket, and uh, and and good on you. But uh, I think it's I, I expect a big effort out of Ohio State this week. I think they're going to roll much like they rolled Michigan State and some, similar games, similar results, and uh, on to Michigan. Totally agree. Well. As always, we are so thankful for you guys. We appreciate you guys kicking it with us for the night. Uh, Again, uh, the Super Chats are amazing. Thank you for all of your support. Uh, If you enjoyed this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also, click that little alert bell. We'll get an alert when we go live. It's usually around 7 every night. So try to stay uh, consistent for you guys. You guys can tune in, uh, kind of appointment television. Uh, We always try to do it leading into Monday Night Football. So it'll be right around that time. But again, as always, uh, shout out where you guys are watching from. I love to see where you guys are watching the show from. I read all the comments. I think it's hilarious how, uh, how much we've spread and how global the show is. I mean, there's people watching basically every continent except Antarctica. And Antarctica is where Jim Harbaugh needs to go. This is a, uh, I got another super chat as I'm closing this thing down. Uh, Ronald, I'm not going to get out of here without answering your question. Uh, thank you for the five. I think the biggest story is that the money center used to raise uh, the, yeah, you know, that's, that's weird. I mean, I think that that was like a way to to, to funnel money. Because um, again, I don't believe anything that this kid said. Like when he said that the the tickets were fifteen bucks and you know, or fifteen thousand dollars for like sixty games. I'm like, dude, like you can't even sit in the worst seats in the stadium at Ohio State and you know, at that capacity and that in that frequency. So I, I think that this was uh, there's going to be some donors that are going to get named that were you know doling out money to fund this operation. That is where it's going to get real hairy. I'm excited to see that. So. Uh, but as always, we thank you guys so much. If you guys uh, really enjoy this, join BuckeyeScoop.com. Again, if you are the biggest Buckeye fan in the world and you're not on BuckeyeScoop.com, um, it, it's like watching television without having you know a 4K TV at this point. I mean, it's really, really a nice apparatus to enhance your Ohio State uh, football enjoying experience. We have a great crowd. See, I see a ton of people that are Buckeye Scoop members at the games. It's always great when they show love. So I appreciate you guys. I'd love for you guys to join the Scoop family. Again, it is always cracking on there. So with that being said, as always, thank you, Buckeye Nation, and thank you, Buckeye Scoop family. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Go Bucks.